Hi, I'm Dr. Paul Ashby, and I welcome you to this streaming service for Richmond Beach Congregational Church, a church that dares to follow the footsteps of Jesus in the 21st century. We're glad you chose to worship with us today. My name is Stacy Schulmerich. I'm the Director of Faith Formation for Children, Youth, and Families. No matter who you are, where you're from, or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here with us. I'm Katie Scovel, Director of Music. We are an open and affirming congregation that is spiritually progressive, seeks truth, lives fully, pursues justice at all ages and stages of our journey together. Join us as we follow the way of Jesus, advocating for immigrant brothers and sisters, supporting the homeless, the sick, and the poor, and taking an honest look at what Jesus would have us to learn today. Welcome to church. Welcome to our community. Welcome to RBCC. Thank you for joining us. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. We have been blessed by peacemakers in our own life, often in our families. Who was the person who was able to listen when you were on a rant and not react and not judge and simply be present and simply be relaxed and give you that space for peace? That person is a special gift in your life. Oftentimes, Peacemaking is difficult. And if you try to give someone a piece of your mind, chances are you will not be very peaceful, nor will they be very peaceful. And do you really have any extra pieces of your mind that you can afford to give away? Most of us, you know, we need all the pieces of our mind in one place at one time. We often honor peacemakers like Gandhi or Martin Luther King after they are gone. If you read their life stories, if you read biographies of Gandhi, 
Martin Luther King, what you'll find is that they had constant struggle in their life and constant abuse and constant fear. Peacemaking is not an easy job. And that's why I think Jesus held them up for a special blessing to realize that the peacemakers among us help us to realize that we are all children of God. Good morning, everybody. The opening prayer today is another version of the Beatitudes, except this time I've gone back to an old Sunday school curriculum and pulled out a version that adds hand motions for children. Because sometimes it's helpful when we're trying to remember something by memory if we add hand motions of a different sense so you can connect the two. And maybe you'll do it with me this morning as a way to bridge the screen that we're all participating in. We'll try to break that layer right there. So the Beatitudes with hand motions. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up a mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to speak, and he taught them, saying this. One, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Two, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Three, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Did you get that? Was M and E. Four, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness sake, for they shall be filled. Five, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Six, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Seven, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. And eight, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Don't
Okay, everybody, for intergenerational time, we're talking about beatitude number seven. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. And really, that's a pretty specific word Jesus used. Jesus didn't say, blessed are the peaceful, or blessed are the peace-filled. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. That requires an action. That's a, that's a job to do. That's a call to arms. The opposite would be chaos makers. And we are living in a world where we seem to have a lot of chaos makers. So what does it mean to be a peacemaker? So I went to Google because I thought, okay, job description of a peacemaker. I wanted that for kids. How can we do this? And what did I get back? A page full of articles from law firms. And I really was like, what? So looking further, Abraham Lincoln, as we know, was a lawyer. And he once said, quote, discourage litigation, persuade neighbors to compromise whenever you can. As a peacemaker, a lawyer has a superior opportunity at becoming a good person. Mahatma Gandhi was a lawyer. And he said, after learning he could settle cases, quote, my joy was boundless. I realized that the function of the lawyer is to unite parties riven asunder. Nelson Mandela was a lawyer. And he said, quote, peace is just not the absence of conflict. Peace is the creation of an environment where all can flourish. And Michelle Obama, a lawyer, who famously said, when they go low, we go high. Those are the words of a peacemaker. So what can we do? I never found a job description of a peacemaker. So I thought that there were probably some qualities that we could use because I always find it helpful if someone tells me, here's something you can do to be, in this case, a peacemaker. So today, we're going to have how to be a peacemaker brought to you by the letter C. And here are some qualities of a peacemaker. First is peacemakers create community. That means they go out and find people who aren't brought together yet and find effective ways to bring them together. Number two, peacemakers create conversation. Conversation is so important. We have to be able to talk to each other. We have to be able to ask questions to hear each other's stories in order to come together. Peacemakers remain calm. It can be so easy with the chaos makers of the world to get angry or reactionary, but peacemakers, they remain calm. Peacemakers find what people have in common. What things bring people together? What's the lowest common denominator that people can come together for so that they can work together? Peacemakers find what's common. Peacemakers try to work for compromise. And that doesn't mean that you have to give up everything. It means that everybody gets something that they want and need. Well, peacemakers respond with compassion. Peacemakers look for the hurt in others and try to understand where it's coming from, to understand them, and then help fill that need. They respond with compassion. Peacemakers collaborate. That means peacemakers invite everyone to the table so everyone can share, everyone can be seen and heard. That way, everybody finds a way to come together in their commonalities. And finally, peacemakers create. That's the whole point, I think, what Jesus was going for, is that peacemakers dynamically create peaceful environments and opportunities for people to come together. Those C words help me figure out how I can best be a peacemaker. You can live out this beatitude too by actively taking small steps of creating, you know, peace in everyday small situations. Little bits. It doesn't need to be huge. You too can be a peacemaker. Maybe you can find your own C words, but today, peacemaking brought to you by the letter C.
Amen. In terms of joys and concerns this week, I want to celebrate a big joy. I can only mention first names, but we celebrate that Denise's pathology report came back with no problem area. She had surgery last Monday, everything looks good. So we celebrate for Denise and her good news. Peace, shalom, salam. A major joy for compassion and service in the state of Washington is there's been a designated $40 million to treat undocumented workers who are suffering from COVID-19. This will save some lives of people who are often forgotten, forgotten as they harvest our fruit, forgotten as they do the meat packing and dangerous jobs within our state. So I'm glad for this act of compassion, reaching out to those in need of help and healing. Peace, shalom, salam. We also, in terms of concerns, pray for healing and learning from recent racial tensions in Shoreline including one African-American family that has been targeted in Shoreline. I want you to also make note of the fall book study. Uh, every Wednesday night we do a God in the News study group on Wednesdays at 7. And on September 9th, we start the book study, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Kendi. So, Please order a copy if you want to join us on September 9th at 7 to discuss the various uh, truths in this book. It is a New York Times bestseller. Uh, if you need any assistance in uh, ordering a book, just let me know. I'll be glad to order a copy for you. Peace. Shalom. Salam. We also pray for... Nicole, who faces surgery on Wednesday for a melanoma on her leg, and her mom, Cindy, who is flying to Miami to be with her as a comforting, caring presence. So we pray particularly for Nicole. Peace, shalom, salam. Let us enter into prayer together. God of peace, we're grateful for the many peacemakers on this earth. Your light has inspired peacemakers of every global faith to teach the ways of compassion, mercy, and understanding. We are thankful that we live in a time when Christians can be friends and co-workers with people of all faiths and no faith. Help us to be agents of peace, first within ourselves, that we would approach life with a sense of humor, with tolerance for others, with faithfulness to doing the best we can, and with a sense of inner balance. Grant us the gifts of peace we need within our heart, mind, and consciousness. And open our hearts to push for justice, even if it disrupts the status quo of society. Let our inner peace grow through our own practice of prayer and meditation, inner awareness, and just taking time to be still and alert and aware to your presence. Help us to honor, remember, and embody the work of peacemakers who are among us, to work with them and walk with them in this society, in this time. We pray this as we follow in your steps as we pray as you taught your disciples to pray by saying, Holy God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Do you remember the childhood rhyme? Here is the church and here is the steeple. Open the doors and wait for it. See all the people. This just underscores something that we talk about <clears throat> often at RBCC. It's not the building. 
It's not the corporate structure. It's the community. Merriam-Webster defines community as a group of people with a common characteristic or interest living together within a larger society. In our family, we have come to believe and rely upon this group of people with their many different characteristics and their common interest of embarking on a spiritual journey in the company of loving fellow journeyers. We want to be part of it and we want it to be a part of us. We met here, we married here, and we raised our kids here. We feel safe here, we feel cherished here, and we feel called to provide the same for others. We also want to do a shout out to the other churches in our community that we are connected to that provide the same for our extended family, friends, and neighbors. We are all better together. So please, consider generously sharing your time, your talents, and your resources to keep our community healthy and able to respond to the challenges of living in a complicated time and place. You can give anywhere, anytime from your computer, smartphone, or tablet. Simply go to website rbccucc.org and click the donations tab. That's rbccucc.org. You can also make a donation by text. Call 206-785-2549. Actually, don't call. Text. And that number again is 206-785-2549. And finally, of course, you can make a donation by mail if it arrives in time. 1512 Northwest, 195th Street in Shoreline, Washington, 98177-2820. That's 1512 Northwest, 195th Street, 195th. Shoreline, Washington, 98177-2820. Let us be the generation of
Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. When I think of the great advocates for peace, they often lived very difficult lives. The historic peacemakers, Gandhi and Martin Luther King, were constantly dealing with threats to their lives and constant slander and threatening mail, and both were assassinated by people from their own faith group, their own faith community. Peacemakers are often not popular until they're gone. Yet we live following in the steps of Jesus, who calls us to the path of being peacemakers, even if it involves self-sacrifice on our part. Peace is often a gift that requires us to look beyond selfish concerns or self-concerns, to ask for the greater good for the greater number. When I think of peacemakers in Seattle, there's one person at the top of my list, and there's not even a close second. At the top of my list is a Muslim, a Muslim imam. Does that surprise you? Not if you've ever met Imam Jamal Rahman. He has a true gift of a brilliant sense of humor, an inner joy and light. He never takes himself too seriously. He's the author of one of my favorite fun books, which is called Sacred Laughter of the Sufis. And it is one that I would urge you to buy if you enjoy humorous reflections. In interfaith dialogues, I've noticed how he is an amazing peacemaker, even when unfairly judged by those who want to project whatever issues they have, whatever anger management issues they have on Muslims and on him because he is a Muslim. I have witnessed where he works to make peace in interfaith dialogues where Muslims are attacked. Oftentimes, the typical attack on Muslims says, well, you're connected with terrorists. Muslims are terrorists. And it tries to paint this broad brush of judgment and criticism when, in reality, 99% of Muslims plus simply want to live as neighbors in peace just as we want to live as neighbors in peace. So it's interesting. After Jamal would listen to an ongoing rant about how Muslims are terrorists, uh, he would simply respond that any act of terrorism does not fit his faith or the teachings of the Quran as historically understood and interpreted. He has that sense of great peacefulness within himself. And you sense that in his response to the various rants. And then in a public dialogue, he'll often get very disrespectful questions that imply that because he's a Muslim, he mistreats or oppresses women. And Jamal will simply argue that yes, for certain Muslim groups and certain nations, that has been a problem and is a real civil rights problem that Muslims need to grow beyond and find a path beyond sexism. He even apologizes for what he is not guilty of because of what is done in various nations by people who are not taking their faith seriously. And I say he apologizes for what he's not guilty of because women are key leaders in his community and teachers within his community. So Jamal has certainly inspired me and given me a sense of the fact that Muslim clergy are open to peace in ways that they don't receive credit for, often in mass media. I've met Muslim clergy in nine different countries. And I will say that 
Jamal is unique for his sense of humor, for his sense of graciousness. He is one of the three amigos here in Seattle. And if you've ever had a chance to attend a Three Amigos event, you sense that gift of peace between the Christian priest, the Muslim imam, and the Jewish rabbi. They are a gift to our community. And if you have a chance to catch a Three Amigos event, please go, because it will inspire you. I will offer peacemaker Jamal a final compliment. If every Muslim was like Jamal, I could be a Muslim very easily. That is the gift he gives to our city as a peacemaker. Peacemakers have special qualities. They always seek to build interfaith connections based on common goals and helping the poor. They look for the good in other people's faith. They look for what they can inspire and complement and what they can connect with in terms of human values. They also seek to find the way in which others would be unfairly treated and respond appropriately. For example, in a conflict, oftentimes Christians will condemn Muslims, and I find that I'll have to sort of interject our own Christian history just to keep things fair and balanced. It's all a matter of perception, and we're, our own perceptions are often shaped by media images that often are not fair to Muslims. How we perceive events shapes our judgments, shapes our view of life. Well-known business writer Stephen Covey tells a story about a train ride from hell that he will never forget. Stephen Covey was stuck on a long train ride with a man whose children had been disturbing everyone. I mean, they were causing all types of chaos. The children were running full speed back and forth in the aisles of the train. They even grabbed the papers of one of the passengers and threw them up in the air so that they filled the aisle. They bumped into people as they ran and said, get out of the way, get out of the way. These kids were creating many stairs of annoyance. And Mr. Covey looked at the dad who was simply staring out the window with a blank expression, zoned out totally unaware of what was going on with his own kids. And once again, Mr. Covey thought, hmm, what an irresponsible parent. What a clueless, notice the arms crossed, clueless, clueless checked out kind of guy. What a thoughtless, thoughtless jerk who doesn't notice what his children are doing. Finally, Covey had had enough. So he said to the man, your children are out of control. They're bothering other passengers. Can you please take control of the situation? And it was like the man was hit with a bucket of cold water. He was stunned. He simply sort of mumbled somewhat coherently, I'm, I'm sorry, I just came back from the hospital. Their mother died. She didn't make it through surgery. The rug has been pulled out from under us, but I know you're, you're right. Um, I need to rein them in. Do you think there was a shift in perception? Covey writes this story about himself and how he learned to know that context is often much more important than content. To make judgments without understanding context 
is often to make misjudgments. Stephen Covey had a train ride he would never forget, but not because the kids were disrupting things, but because of his own rush to judge a situation without the facts, without a chance for the person who was in deep pain and loss and grief to even offer a response. We see peacemaking is often a difficult job. Jesus was a wonderful peacemaker. And that peacemaking sometimes created more problems for himself. I think of the wonderful way in which Jesus shared the love of God with a tax collector named Zacchaeus. This scorned social reject Zacchaeus was transformed by the loving presence of Jesus. And that loving presence of Jesus so shaped his heart and mind and consciousness that he made full restitution to anyone he had cheated as a tax collector. Peace came to his heart and home. Zacchaeus was reborn as a child of God, and he saw everyone that he had worked with, that he had mistreated, that he had cheated of their income, also as children of God. And yet, Jesus did this wonderful thing in creating new community for Zacchaeus. And oh my goodness, what did they say? Jesus, he's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So peacemaking, even within your own circle, can be a difficult thing. I think of another instance when a bloodthirsty mob with stones in their hands, dragged a woman to Jesus. They were ready to execute her, and they wanted to get his consent. They wanted to get his approval for this act of execution. The woman was caught in adultery, and it doesn't say where exactly was the man or others who were involved in this situation. Where exactly were actually the witnesses? Jesus, the peacemaker, had no desire for blood, no desire for punishment, no desire to hurt or harm this person. He even dares to suggest that no human being was morally qualified to be her judge. Jesus says to those with stones ready, let the one without fault throw that first stone. When Jesus set this person free, what do you think the gossip was that spread through the city? Peacemaking is not easy. It calls us to move past our normal comfort zone because we live in a society where punishment is so popular. We're in a culture where punishment is politically advantageous and popular. With 5% of the world's population, the United States imprisons 21% of those imprisoned on this planet. 5%, 21%. Politicians know that punishment is popular. The worst thing they can say often is, you're soft on crime. Peacemaking involves shifting your priorities and seeing a wider, bigger picture. When we look at the world in which we live, it's important to note the facts. When Christians attack Muslims and scorn Muslims or Jewish people, in interfaith dialogues, I have to remind Christians that we have our own history, the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, the battles between Catholics and Protestants for over 100 years in Central Europe, Northern Ireland, and the tensions between Protestants and Catholics. And in our own church's history, First Congregational Church of Salem, Massachusetts, that hosted the Salem Witch Trials, peacemaking has to be reality-based. And when 
you look at your own history and tradition, you're able to see others more clearly. You're able to see others and realize that all religious groups have had their times when they forgot the blessing, the beauty, the wonder, the gift of peace. And oftentimes, peacemaking calls us back to reality. In Tulsa, <clears throat> when a Buddhist group wanted to become a part of the Ecumenical Council of Tulsa, along with Muslims and uh, Jewish groups, the Ecumenical Council had a person <clears throat> who attacked the idea and said, we don't want Buddhists as part of this ecumenical council and denounce them as idol worshipers and a new age religion that came out of the 60s. Well, I had to reply that this new age religion, as she referred to them, has actually been around 500 years longer than Christianity. So sometimes you have to confront ignorance in dealing with peacemaking in order to get the right discernment. Peacemaking is often in conflict with ignorance and prejudice. So I want to affirm the children of God who are peacemakers among us. Think about the person in your family or in your circle of life whose heart and life has been dedicated to acts of peacemaking. Place a hand on your heart. Breathe in and breathe out. Think of that person's face. Think of that person's countenance. Think of that person's presence when they walk into a room with you. Visualize the great peacemaker in your life, whether it was a grandmother, whether it was an uncle, whether it was your mom, whether it was your dad. Hold on to that gift of their presence in your life. Feel gratitude for who they are. Experience the gift that they leave through their love. And feel what it is like to experience firsthand in your own presence, in your own heart, in your own depth of being. Experience what it is to know a peacemaker. And then as a child of God, hold Jesus within your heart, knowing that he is a peacemaker among us still, calling us to a different view of life, a different view of mercy, a different view of justice, a different view of punishment from what we have in our own society. How does he do it? He does it by seeing that we are all children of God. Amen. One, two, three, four. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let your love increase. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Walls of pride and prejudice shall cease. When we are your instruments of peace, Pride and prejudice shall 
today is by Mary Lou Kaunaki and she wrote this prayer, the prayer for a decade of nonviolence, back when the United Nations came together and declared the beginning of the 21st century, the decade of nonviolence. And this is her prayer. And I hope you can hear it with ears as if she's not just speaking for herself, but that you can hear your prayer in it too. A prayer for the decade of nonviolence. I bow to the sacred in all creation. May my spirit fill the world with beauty and wonder. May my mind seek truth and humility and openness. May my heart forgive without limit. May my love for friend, enemy, and outcast be without measure. May my needs be few and my living simple. May my actions bear witness to the suffering of others. May my hands never harm a living being. May my steps stay on the journey of justice. May my tongue speak for those who are poor without fear of the powerful. May my prayers rise with patient discontent until no child is hungry. May my life's work be passion for peace and nonviolence. May my soul rejoice in this present moment. May my imagination overcome death and despair with new possibility. And may I risk reputation, comfort, and security to bring this hope to the children of the world. Amen. Now I've been happy living, thinking about the good things to come, and I believe it could be something good has begun. Oh, and I've been smiling lately, dreaming about the world as one, and I believe it could be someday. Out on the edge of darkness, there rides a peace train. Peace train, take this country, come take me home again. Now I've been smiling lately, thinking about the good things to come. And I believe it could be, something good has begun. Oh, peace train sounding louder, light on the peace train. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Come on, the peace train. Ooh, 
get your bags together Go bring your good friends too Cause it's getting nearer Soon it will be with you Now come and join the living It's not so far from you And it's getting nearer Soon it will all be true Oh, peace string sounding louder Cause out on the edge of darkness There rides a peace train